Alrighty, welcome back friends. So um, for this next segment, we are going to focus on the origin stories of the different types of sediments. So when we're talking about the origin stories, there's four main uh, ones. Lithogenous, which means of the land. Uh, think of like the, the lithosphere, right? So similar sort of root word there. Then we have biogenous, which means they're made out of biological things, so living things of sorts. Um, and then hydrogenous simply means uh, chemical reaction. Um, so the ocean is extremely corrosive and it can do some chemical damage. Not maybe not damage is the right word, but do some do some chemical reactions. <laughs> and then lastly is cosmogenous. Um, so I want you to first think when we think of um, where sediments come from in terms of from the land, think to yourself, maybe pause the video for just a second and think to yourself where these could come from. Where on earth could these uh, things come from? So think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Okay. Um, so of the land. And by the way, uh, lithogenous can also be known as terogenous. Those two words are interchangeable. So the four main ways that we can uh, get um, lithogenous sediment one to be from rivers, right? We've seen a couple of examples already this semester of rivers flowing into an area, um, into the oceans, and we can literally see uh, a browner, uh, murkier color uh, as opposed to out in the open ocean. The wind is also an extremely good mover of dust and those finer sediments. Uh, we oftentimes see uh, huge dust blooms off of big, big, big deserts like the Sahara Desert, um, in Africa, in Northern Africa, and those are blow over into the Atlantic Ocean and actually settle uh, onto the, the surface of the ocean, which actually ends up being good nutrients for phytoplankton. Um, but we'll talk more about that later. Wind also, you know, is a really dang good uh, eroder as well. Um, so with wind and gravity can come into this, this term of erosion. So the breaking down of the the, the harder sort of rocks that are right next to the, the, um, the shore. And also, and this is one is kind of often forgotten, I think, is that of glaciers. So ice is an extremely efficient mover of land. Things get carved out by ice all the time. Um, think of like the Great Lakes of the northern United States. Those were carved out because of glacial activity. Um, and a lot of like how the, the Great Plains are also these really beautiful um, rolling hills, and those were likely um, formed from the movement of glaciers. So there's kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, two, two like further classifications of uh, different types of, of uh, lithogenous sediment. The first is called narratic uh, lithogenous deposits. So narratic means of the coast. So these would be more like um, they're found closer to the continental margins, and they usually consist mostly of eroded rocks um, that are that are transported to the ocean by rivers. And I also have, um, going back to this idea of turbidite deposits, right? We talked about those deep sea fans and how river currents can kind of churn things up a little bit, and it gives it this really beautiful sort of... Um, uh, swirly kind of pattern and it can eventually settle down um, and then we'll see some graded bedding in that. I'm hoping to have a video made um, in the next several days or so uh, of a demonstration that I have um, at one of the other schools here. So narratic lithogenous deposits simply means of the coast or of the land. Alternatively, we have another term uh, for the deeper oceans, and this is called pelagic deposit, so abyssal or red clays. So pelagios means of the sea, so as opposed to coming from the land, uh, necessarily we're coming from the sea. Again, this this uh, this image here kind of gives me like a really sort of like if you were to stick your hand in it, it would like give like a really kind of nasty like I don't know noise, <laughs> just of how kind of smooth it looks, right? And also consider how um, kind of very smooth, maybe a little bit dimply here and there, but overall a very kind of flat sort of uh, pattern here. 
And a really good exercise to do, which may be beneficial, um, is to look at the different uh, thicknesses between the neritic versus pelagic um, deposits of lithogenous deposits. So this here is a map looking at neritic versus pelagic deposits. The warmer colors indicating a thicker deposit um, or a th thicker thickness and the cooler colors indicating a cooler thickness. So what I would suggest you do is pause the video real quick or at the very end when you're looking over the slides, consider where you see some of these uh, thicker thicknesses of these deposits, of these sediment deposits before we hit rock, right? Right along the coastlines, right, is where we see the greater thicknesses of these deposits. So it's a really interesting thing to point out. Our next type of sediment is biogenous sediments. So biogenous, think of biology, uh, meaning you know of life of some sort of living thing that can consist of a variety of different shells um, or like sand dollars or creatures or skeletons. Um, this, is, this picture here is just showing all the different kinds of shells that are out there or bones or teeth, right? Lots of sharks have lots of teethies and they fall out and they're gonna end up somewhere. They'll usually end up at the bottom of the ocean. Or this image here on the right side are different types of plankton. We'll talk much deeper about plankton later on, but I just wanna kind of point out, um, just to check out how symmetrical these creatures are. They're, they're microscopic. You cannot see them with your naked eye, but just the fact that mother nature can make something so pretty and so small and so symmetrical is really, really quite fascinating. Another thing I want to uh, consider when we think of biogenous sediments is poop is gonna be involved in this as well. Um, lots of whale poop, uh, big, these big creatures gotta take big poops as well as, um, and that's gonna be you know broken down plankton or um, some of the, the creatures that eat meat, like some of like the killer whales or dolphins, their poop is gonna consist of, you know, bits and pieces of, of the animals that they've consumed. I know that sounds really gross, but it's just the reality of mother nature. But first we're gonna talk a little bit further on this idea of plankton. So there's two kind of different shells that we observe with different plankton. Right now we're gonna focus on four different kinds of plankton um, and kind of broken down into separate uh, varietals. So on the top row here, we're looking at autotroph plankton, meaning that they um, are algae or plants, meaning they make their own food. They make their own food. They don't have to eat anything else in order to sustain. They use the sunlight and they use carbon dioxide and they take that and that's their energy. The second row are heterotrophs. So heterotroph means that they are some sort of protozoan or animal, meaning they have to eat other animals in order to sustain life. Um, so they can't just hang out in the sun and call it a day. They ha actually have to physically eat other things. From there, we can also break them down into chemical composition. So um, the CaCO3, that just means calcium in a way, calcium carbonate shells versus sili silicon shells. So calcium carbonate versus silicon, um, as you can imagine, one requires calcium. Um, uh, like calcium is, is good for our bones, right? We won't need to drink all the milk so that our bones grow big and strong. Um, Whereas silicon, and this one's going to be a little bit of a weird analogy, but um, if anyone gets any sort of breast augmentation, um, fake boobs are made out of silicon. So it's kind of a, a way to think of it that way. But when we uh, break down these different sediments, we can kind of further break them down in this way. Are they made out of calcium carbonate or are they made out of silicon? Um, are they made from a, an animal that makes its own food or are they made of an animal that... Um, has to go and forage for its own food. So some ways that you may uh, think of, or some examples, I guess I should say, of some of these uh, creatures uh, in sand form or in sediment form are the, the narratic biogenous deposits. So I'm so sorry that I'm going to ruin any sort of beautiful sandy, uh, fine sandy beach for you. Um, but it turns out a lot of those really beautiful tropical sandy beaches, even like the ones in Hawaii, uh, are made up of fish poop. So 
fish poop, most specifically parrotfish, um, eat coral and eat algae off of the coral. And then they digest that coral and then their poop is then sand. So you're welcome. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's the truth. It's really quite fascinating. Um, or if you've ever had the opportunity to use chalkboards, um, the chalk that we use are actually uh, old, old coccolithophores, which by the way are my favorite plankton. They're just the most fun to say, but coccolithophores um, make up chalk or limestone cliffs. This is These are limestone cliffs in England, so kind of cool. And then the last little bit in terms of um, biogenous sediments that I want to touch on are something called oozes. And this one's kind of weird. Um, so these are pelagic biogenous deposits. They are technically called oozes, but they're not like oozing out <laughs> of excuse me, of the bottom of the ocean. That's kind of a, a misconception, at least that I had to break um, when I was learning about this. It's not like oozing out of the bottom. It's actually more so floating from the, from the top. There's two different kinds. The first is silicous ooze, um, and that's generally found in colder waters. So um, in these, these cooler, cooler waters here, we have uh, areas of um, higher productivity, meaning higher uh, plankton blooms or higher plankton presence. And then that those can be broken down and then will eventually sink to the bottom of the ocean. And those tests or the, the remnants of those creatures then accumulate at the bottom and we call that silicus ooze. So silicus ooze, cold water. Whereas um, calcareous ooze is warm water. Um, so calcite secreting warm water organisms living near the surface. Um, you know, bloom up there and then they sink down. What's really interesting with calcareous ooze is it eventually ends up breaking down and disintegrating at what's called the calcium uh, composition depth. And um, with that, the calcium literally breaks down because it's too it's too much um, for for the composition of of those creatures, and it ends up breaking down and dissolving. Um, or is then sick or like put further um, underneath these layers of silicus ooze. So they, they're either completely broken down or put under a layer. So calcium, warm water, silicon, cold water. And if we were to look at the global distribution of all these sediments, this is a, a wonderful map in your, um, in your book. So I encourage you to take a look at this map and um, look at the various a distribution of the sediments around the bottoms of the oceans. So when we come back in our last little video here, uh, we'll finish up talking about different sediment types. All right, thank you for listening and watching.